Trigger warning. This podcast contains discussions about abuse, domestic violence, and intimate partner violence. Listener discretion is advised. What you are about to hear is a true story. My story. This podcast is about me, my abusive marriage, my fight for my life, an eventual daring escape from my ex-husband and his enabling family. My name is Bibi, and I am the Authenticity Warrior. My discernment about what I am facing has made me a target, but I must nonetheless speak up. Hello, everybody. This is Bibi here, the Authenticity Warrior, and I'm back. Um, This time, I have with me here my very good friend. Um, We're going to call her Roxy. (laughs) Because she's a rock star, honestly. Um, And I just decided to just give her that name. I am honored to have the friendship that I have with her. And I brought her on here because, as you guys know, um, we've been discussing my story, my journey. And there have been many key players, many in my corner. And I just felt it's important to bring at least a few of them on here so that you can hear from them. Not only does it give legitimacy to my story, but I'm sure that there are some things that will come out in this interview that, you know, I may have never thought to speak about um, if I didn't bring them on here. And so that's why I brought her here. And like I said, her name is Roxy. We've known each other for... <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. This is since like 08, 2008 is when we met. And over the years, our relationship has just grown richer. This is one of those friendships that when it was starting, I did not anticipate it's lasting this long, but it has. And it's been great. It's been wonderful. And I'm just so grateful for the friendship that I have with her. As you can imagine, in this time in my life, she has been one of the people that I've been able to lean on, you know, despite everything that is going on in her own life, it's been outstanding to me how she's been able to kind of hold space and be there for me. And I'm just so grateful. So without rambling on for too long, I'm just going to say welcome, Roxy. If you want to give a quick intro, if not, you can just say hi to the people. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Hi, everybody. So I am a little like somber because of the nature of what we're going to be discussing, but um, my heart is here with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Roxy. Yeah. So let's just dive right into it. Honestly, as someone who's been on the outside, kind of looking in, I mean, you were a bridesmaid <laughs> to my wedding. You kind of knew Paulinos and I prior to us getting married. Like you kind of had a bird's eye view a little bit of when we were dating. Then we got married. And then you had also moved to Nigeria. So it's like the two of us were in Nigeria together. And you were, if not the only friend that I had with me from prior to meeting Paulino. So it always felt to me like you were some sort of oasis of just like peace and calm and just a reminder of, of who I am. And so every time we would interact, it just felt so great to come back into myself as the baby that I knew myself to be. So I think saying all of this, I just want to ask though, given how long you've known me, given how much you've known about my relationship with Paulinus prior to us getting married up until the point where I had to even flee, at what point did you begin to suspect that, you know, there were some problems (laughs) in this marriage that I had with Paulinus? So I said, I'm just going to go right in to answer the questions like directly. If you have any like comments or questions or whatever, um, you can, you know, let me know. But to answer that question specifically, I think I started to notice when I was witnessing a lot of like fights between you and him. And they weren't just fights. Like there would literally be incidents where Paulinus would be reporting you to me i remember we had like a whole conversation about like you know the kinds of things that he wanted you to wear how he wanted you to get your hair done or your nails done i mean it's one thing for someone to expect that you have your hair and nails done but then also it's like even in like inappropriate circumstances for instance like you know when you had just given birth to your last boy and when you had come back to nigeria When I had come to see you guys at the house, because I remember I came to see you much later on the day that you arrived. 
and he had called me out to your room and then literally told me that he wanted me to tell you something. And I asked what something was and then he said, I should tell you to try and get your hair and your nails done. So, you know, it was just instances like that. And now that wouldn't be the first time, by the way, there are, there are multiple instances, but, you know, I'll let you kind of zero in on what you want to know more about. This was the day that I arrived into Nigeria with our third child, who was six yeah. weeks old at the time. That very yeah. night, you had come over at my request. And uh-huh. that night, Paulinus was telling you to tell me to fix yeah. my hair. Why didn't I fix my hair? Yeah. Like your hair or your nails. And in that moment, like to me, I, I just looked at him and I said, like, I thought he was joking. Like, this is somebody who has literally gone and given birth to a third healthy baby boy by herself for the most part. And then she's coming back. And then the day she's at the airport, you expect that her hair and her nails should be done like, Mm. You know, as, as someone who was my friend and then to hear like her quote unquote husband saying that to her, like, I can't imagine the kind of position that you were now put in. And then you now having to be the one to try and navigate that. Like, yeah. like what do you say to that? Really? Before we even proceed, I'd like to circle back this because you, when you said fights, I do want to you to clarify that because I am not a fighter. Like I'm not a confrontational person. So when you say fights, can you describe what you mean? Um, yes, I can definitely describe what I mean. So fights in the sense that, and that's why I went into detail about the reporting. And that's why I had to like really clarify what I meant by fights. So it would oftentimes be him coming up to me saying some of the things that you did, some of the things that you didn't do. And then for me, the biggest indicator that there were issues in this uh, marriage was the day this guy tried to touch me. Oh gosh. I mean, we've spoken about this multiple times and as much as I don't have anything to be sorry about, I, I do want to just say again publicly that Roxy, I, I really, really, really am sorry that you were put in such a position. I'm embarrassed, even though it's not even my shame to carry, but I'm so embarrassed that like, my God, that he did that with you. Yeah, he did. And for me, I just like, I was literally like frozen in shock, first of all, because I remember what had happened was that I had promised the boys that I was going to take them out to the beach. And we had planned this beach thing a while back. I remember when you asked me to even go and pick the boys up as well, just to do something during their break. And I drove down there. And I remember in the morning of when I got there, I found this man like, I don't know if he was drunk or high or like a combo of both. Like barely hungover. (laughs) Yeah. And like this guy literally had no energy to come. And like I got there, there there were no nannies in the house. Like these boys were just doing whatever. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I was just shocked. I'm like, okay. So I start to try and get them ready. In fact, he's so useless that I literally have to call you on my phone Remember, for yeah. you to start to show me where the diapers were. Okay, so where guys, is the- just to paint the picture. Sorry, Roxy, just to paint the picture. I was in Canada at the time. I was pregnant with our third child. And I had, you know, asked Roxy to please go just because I was just so concerned with my sons in this man's hands, especially as my nanny had gone back to her village to take care of her mom. Her mom had just fallen ill. So I was very concerned. So I asked Roxy to go check in on them. So this is what she's describing. She gets there. This guy is like passed out, just severely hung over. The boys are just running amok. And Roxy had to call me from Canada to be describing where their soap was, where their sponge was, bathe them, get them ready. Because the guy was just, he was just a useless piece of, I don't know what to even call the guy. Because he, he, I mean, because he didn't even know where the diapers were. In fact, the boys were more helpful um, <laughs> than he was at the time. So, you know, I said, okay, you know what? Maybe he had a wonderful night and let's just support the vision here. And at the time, you know, he hadn't tried to touch me. So I didn't even think in my mind that anything like sinister was going to happen um, by the end of that day. But I remember, I remember, you know, he couldn't even drive us to the beach. And it was on that account, he still wanted to cancel the outing even after the boys were ready. And I said, no, like we've come all this way. They're excited. We've eaten, we're prepped. Like we're going to go. So if you can't drive, then give me the car keys. I'll drive. Mm-hmm. 
In fact, while we're even driving, <laughs> one of the boys was saying, why are you driving daddy's car? Because <laughs> <laughs> he was annoyed that he was driving the dad's car and said, mm-hmm. sorry, because that is tired, you know? Mm-hmm. And he slept through it all, went to the beach, you know, went to the beach, found a different location, slept through it all as well. You so know, he slept I, through that outing pretty much. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you had sent me some pictures of them. Like, I think he took a couple yeah. of them, but for the most part, he was just not, was okay. was not there. He wasn't present. Mm-mm. I mean, I, I don't want to even dwell too much on this um, beach day. So bottom line is you guys go to the beach. He's really not that much help. You're the mm-hmm. one heavy lifting with the carrying of the boys. Uh, and then we get back. back and, you know, I put the boys to bed, you know, tuck them in and whatever. And then I go downstairs, right? And you know I'm what? To- Sorry, Roxy. That, that part also shook me because this guy did not even do the bedtime routine with them. He left you to do it. Yeah. I definitely did it. So I went downstairs. I was on my laptop. Um, I was working on something. And then that's when he came down and he made a move at me. Mm. And I was just very confused, you know, because in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, from where to where? So it was what made me uncomfortable. And it prompted me to put a call through to you. Hold on, Roxy, because um, Mm. as much as I don't want you to go into too much detail because I know this is a very uncomfortable situation for you. But when you say made a move, like based off of what I already know about the story, he was touching you inappropriately. Yeah. And he had never done that before. He had never had any reason to touch you, even just even to touch you before. Oftentimes, in fact, he's even insulting me. He makes it seem as though, okay, like I'm quote unquote undesirable. You know how he used to comment on my dressing and And like like, what other men would think. Hmm. He used to yeah. comment on my dressing a lot. He's like, "Why are you dressed like that? Why are you dressed?" And then every single time, like, you comment on it, I say I didn't care. But, so, basically, up until that point, your relationship had mostly just been banter. You stroke you, yeah. you know, it was just yeah, back and yeah. forth. Like there was never, and I was always there. This is the first time that yeah. you never had. Any yeah, this is the first up. time that you wouldn't be around at all. Mm-hmm. Exactly, and this is the first time that he would be like so yeah. close to you. Touching yeah. you, you know, oh my goodness. I, I really, again, I am so sorry that you had to be put in that position. And um, of course, I, from what you said, like you froze because you're like, and you know, I really, I really, really hate this. I hate this for us. I hate this for women where men bring their freaking audacity. And we're often so stunned that we actually freeze in position because we're just like, we don't know what to do. Do you understand what I mean? Like, because no, of- I mean, that's not something that you're walking around like expecting at any point to happen. So it, why, why wouldn't that be shocking to anybody? You know, especially if that's not where your mind was at. Like for me, I was just like, okay, what's going on here? Like, and like I said, that's what prompted me to call you. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You remember I had to call you and keep you on the phone for like a couple hours where it was like the three of us just talking. I remember that day and in my head, I was just like, "Ah, Abby, (laughs) you know, because then you didn't even tell me why, you know, you had just called me. I was in Canada. Yeah, I just called you immediately. I didn't say anything to you, but I just wanted you to be there. Mm-hmm. I didn't know. All I just knew is that you had called me and then we were on the phone for hours. I mean, that yeah. was usual. We're often on the phone for hours, but he was just there, just like in the corner. You were on the phone with me. And then mm-hmm. at some point, he was started to do as if he was sleepy or whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, so <laughs> maybe he wanted me to, so that maybe you wrap up the call or something. <laughs> and then hmm. you get back. Was, to the so I stayed on that call. I said, nope. We, all of us were going to die here today. <laughs> yes. And then, in fact, that was how the, the night ended. I think you stayed yeah, on because the call. Because nobody was in the house with us, right? Yeah. Like, so you stayed on the call basically up until like you went to bed. And- yeah, like almost 3 a.m. I remember like past three, like I stayed there. In fact, seems if you're still sleeping. Yeah. I'm so sorry you were put in that position again. And, um, you know, I think all of this is all the more, you know, it leaves a a really, really bad taste in my mouth, especially knowing how this was sometime in July by November, you know, when I was coming back to Nigeria and, you know, I had called you and I had told you that, look, I need you to be at that airport. 
you know, I couldn't even get into the details of why, but I just told you that under no circumstance can I be left alone in that house with that man that I don't know what I'm walking into. And I need at least a couple days to gauge the energy in the room. And, you know, of course, I've spoken about this uh, on the podcast. And basically, this is the friend. Roxy was who I asked to meet me at the airport because I was afraid. I'm like, I don't want this guy to rape me. I don't want this guy to force me to have sex with him. And I don't know what he's been doing in Nigeria. We've been on bad terms for pretty much the entirety of this pregnancy. And he just had a track record, a history of just constantly manipulating me and forcing me into a sexual space when I wasn't ready. I had just literally had my final appointment with my midwives in Canada. You know, my baby was six weeks. Like, yeah, I'm now able to have sex, but I just wasn't ready and definitely not with this person. And so I had begged Roxy. She was even working. You know, I begged. I said, look, like you have to meet me at that airport. You have to. And, you know, she was alarmed, but, you know, she agreed that she would. Unfortunately, she had spent overtime at work. She couldn't meet me at the airport. And guys, I've already described just the sick feeling in my stomach where I could have thrown up if I had room to or leave to actually do that. I was so sad when I didn't see her at that airport. But like in true Roxy fashion, she showed up 12 a.m. that day to my house. Literally, (laughs) she was just like, nah, she wasn't going to leave me in that position. So this is when you now showed up to the house. And this is now when he now started to tell you that, hey, why didn't I do my hair and my nails in Canada? Mm -hmm. Came back to Nigeria and all that bullshit. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you take that? Me saying that, look, Roxy, you have to meet me at the airport. I can't be alone with this guy. I mean, it was shocking. And that's what I was um, saying in terms of like, you know, when you, first going back to your initial question, like when I noticed problems and these, these were some of the things that I was witnessing. Some things very early on when we we'll be talking about, you know, I remember when you had cut your hair, uh, some of the feedback that he had as well wasn't pretty so while i wasn't shocked by the request but i was also curious like what damage are we talking here like Mm -hmm. where you need like another person to be there when you arrive this is supposed to be when couples you know you haven't seen each other for a very long time because someone has been away doing whatever this is supposed to be that time where everybody wants to see each other it's happy but to hear the desperation in your voice like i just knew that that was not time to be asking questions it was just like okay well, how are we making this happen so that we can guarantee safety first before we start to ask any questions if anything is going down. Yeah. And I just thank you so much for being there for me. And again, given where you were in your own life, like the things you were dealing with, I'm constantly in awe with how you were just able to even put your own self aside and be there for me, you know, not even knowing, you know, just even the gravity of what it was that I was dealing with. But, you know, still on this topic of like sex, out of all my friends, not even my siblings. You're the only one that I ever even went into some detail about my sexual life with. There's something that you had said earlier that kind of shocked me. And in a way, I can't even imagine as a friend how this must have been such a tough position for you. So there's something you said. You said you didn't know how to tell your friend that she was being raped. Can you elaborate on that and what brought you to that conclusion? Yeah, with that, it was just, first of all, like I knew you were a virgin going into that. So whatever sexual experience you were having was what you were having with this guy. And like for me, that was problematic, first of all. (laughs) <laughs> because you know, some of the experiences, how you would describe certain things, like, you know, with pain, mm-hmm. a lot of pain. The lack of foreplay. The lack of foreplay, exactly. The forcing you to have sex when you do want to, like coercing you literally. Or the one time you had described to me when you said you guys were having anal sex and, you know, it was hurting and you were asking him to stop and he didn't. Mm. You know, consent can be withdrawn at any time like, where sex is concerned, right? Mm-hmm. If you literally ask somebody to stop because you're doing something uncomfortable and they continue to, they're basically violating your boundaries, your body, voice. And that is what rape is. For me, when I recount my sexual life with this guy, I've said it before on this podcast that 
I would term it as just mostly traumatic. But when I think specifically about that anal incident, like for me, it was so difficult for me to utter the, the words rape, but my body had no problem saying that. The way my body reacted, I said it over and over again, I sounded like a wounded animal. I had never heard myself make such primal sounds before. I had never heard myself sound in such despair. I just gave up. He just wouldn't stop. And I remember recounting that story to you. I think I remember you were silent, but it's now in retrospect when I think we had had a conversation about it again. And you were saying that in your head, you were just like, how do I tell this girl that she's being raped? Like, that's not a conversation like anybody would ever want to have with someone and say, "Ah, your husband raped you, actually. Yeah. Very awkward. I'm so glad to have people like you in my corner because the moment I myself finally was able to come to that truth, to that understanding, because it's difficult. Again, this is someone that you love, you loved for a very long time. Love really does cover all. And it goes over time to the point of like delusion, pretty much. (laughs) And so I'm so glad that by the time I was able to finally settle into the truth of what actually happened and what has been happening the entire cause of our marriage in terms of just the coercive nature of our sex life, um, Mm -hmm. I had a lot of validation from my support system, from you, especially that I've been speaking to and been saying that, look, I don't enjoy sex with this guy. Like he wasn't doing it. Like, oh my goodness. (laughs) It's one thing to be going through all of that. And then it's another thing for you to have an underwhelmingly like small size dick. Because remember when I asked you, right? Oh my God. <laughs> See, really like, like, because yeah. I was just like on top of every, you're going to chop like abuse and then even the size is not um, like, <laughs> sorry. No. Oh my God. Like this no, is <laughs> not. Face we want to be in life. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my god, this is honestly I wasn't expecting to laugh, but yeah, and you know this is actually facts. Look, guys, we're not trying to size shame here. Look, at the end of the day, it's like so we're going to go through all this trauma and still on still like where is the meat? Like. (laughs) Yeah. And here's why, because like, I don't want to say we're not trying to size shame and then we do, right? Like, well, my point is that you were a virgin before you went into marriage, right? So whatever it is that he had is what you were getting, period. Mm-hmm. That to me is what feels like the injustice here. Like, I don't even know if you <laughs> had an opportunity to even at least like you know, figure out what you wanted so that you could choose. So th- I'm speaking to this specific situation, right? <laughs> because there are some people who don't care about size and who don't care about all of that, you know, and there's that too. So, sorry, I know you don't have time, but I, I have to say this. I want you as my friend to have amazing sex, wonderful sex, sex where you feel like, you know, you're being loved and you're being valued. You feel like you're the most beautiful woman in the world where someone is like, you know, using affection to like show you exactly how much they love you Hmm. like why wouldn't i want that like that is exactly what i would want for myself that is exactly what i would want for my friends and when i look around and i just see that that's not what's being given or that's not what was promised or intended like then there's something wrong here and then we're talking superficially about that then only for us to go deeper and then find out that's like there's rape Hmm. There's abuse. Mm. Listen, that's heavy. One of the things I've also had to come to terms with was that my not really knowing much about life, my, my being so naive actually made me a target for people like Polinus. Mm-hmm. And that's why when he jammed me, he just couldn't believe the bonanza. And so this guy didn't let me go. That's why for him, when he started to unmask and really wild out and show his real self, I was in shock and in disbelief for much of the time. It took me a while to actually just understand what the hell was happening to me because I felt like I was hoodwinked. I was sold a dream in so many respects. In sex, I was sold a dream in the kind of life I was going to live. I was was sold a dream and I was giving a nightmare, honestly. And so it just sucks. And you know, that prayer that you just prayed, I say a wholehearted amen that my goodness, I deserve. (laughs) I deserve to have a dream of a sex life, to have a dream of a 
you know, sex partner that would be all the things and do all the things and, you know, help me along on my healing from all this trauma. And again, this is how the topic of asexuality even came up because I just read my body shut down from sex. And so sometime in April, 2021, when I discovered about asexuality, I really, really felt like this was speaking to me because it explained why, like, I just didn't want to be intimate with this guy. And I'm still trying to figure out what my body is, what my orientation is in that sense. But my goodness, I'd been traumatized. And so my body shut down from sex. And that's why the gay sexuality movement really resonated with me. But I mean, I'm open to all the exploring to come after that. And, you know, Mm -hmm. I I still have a long life ahead of me. And that is what I'm going to spend my time doing, just rediscovering who I am, understanding who I am, you know, all facets, including sex. Okay. Well, I think we've spoken enough about this topic. So I'll just like to just redirect us a little bit, kind of to the fact that I had gotten back to Nigeria, the atmosphere, it just wasn't it. And I felt like I was in serious danger. I felt like puzzle pieces were being moved around me and I was not aware I felt like the other shoe was about to drop and I was going to be decimated by whatever plans Paulinus and his family were cooking up. And so I pulled a preemptive strike and I escaped with my children out of the country. I fled to Canada and immediately just began to just attend to things legally to figure out how my rights as a mom can be preserved here and, you know, not be destroyed. But in all of that, you played just one key role, which is I packed up my things and Mm -hmm. then I tell you, because you were on set for much of the time, so I could barely even really get a hold of you after that first two nights Mm -hmm. you stayed with me at the house. But at some point, I call you and I'm like, hey, I need you to come get these bags. And I think I tell you some story that, oh, I'm going to take them to my mom's or something like that, Sha. Of course, you now later find out that, oh, I had actually done this mad escape, this mad dash (laughs) out of the country and all of that. And for some reason, you become a primary target for Paulinus and his family because they find out. Yeah, because they find out about the suitcases that I helped you with the suitcases. So they thought it was me who... Yeah. (laughs) I don't know what it was that they thought. You know, funny, yeah. like, because I, I believe it was even you that told them, I think because they had been calling you, I think, or something. I think you said it to his, his sister or something. that Because you even said it in such a nonchalant way. Yeah. I mean, I was like, yeah. Because, you know, as far as I knew, you had to drop it off with your mom. Mm-hmm. That's what you had said at the time. Mm-hmm. And what was my own, like, you know, if you needed help, as usual, like, I mean, for me, A lot of people say, oh, okay, but you didn't ask or whatever. Like, and I remember this was a line of questioning I was getting from, was it his mom? Yeah, it was his mom or something. And I'm like, it's the same way I showed up to go and carry your kids out to the beach. Like for me, it's just like, okay, my friend needs something. Can I do it? Yes or no. And then I'll just show up in that way. So we had asked me to come and pick up the suitcases. What was my own? I had to come and pick it up and I picked it up. And then I told them just as much, right? So I wasn't even aware at the time that they found out from me (laughs) that I had picked up suitcases more so because he had cameras in the house, right? Mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. yeah. He would have seen it anyways, right? So, yeah. So how did it feel when it became a matter where you were now seriously antagonized? It got to a point where they were saying all sorts of things about you to my parents, to anybody who would listen that, oh, that Roxy, they were trying to describe you as some sort of Jezebel, bad influence, all these her single friends, see the way she dresses, see the way she looks, uh, she does this, she does that, In her presence on social media, this is how she is. You know, they were trying to paint you as some sort of immoral, they were trying to call you a hoe pretty much. They're like, this is... <laughs> So, like, how did that make you feel? Me, I was just very happy because, first of all, remember I had joined you that year to Ekiti with everybody there. And while we were out there, I had shared clips from my show at the time. It was a popular show on YouTube. And then we all sort of, like, watched it. They loved it and whatnot. 
and people clapped and it seemed as though they liked it. And I say seemed because if there was anything wrong with it at the time, like if you were being authentic or honest or, you know, yourself, you would have at least communicated that, right? That maybe there was something about it that you didn't like. Well, we didn't hear anything about that up until finally, according to them, you went missing, right? Over a year later, because... Guys, just to clarify, this is over a year later. Sometime in December 2020, Roxy had followed me to Ikiti because, again, the tension in that house, I just needed a buffer. So I had invited Roxy over and she graciously came and spent Christmas with us. During this time in Ikiti, she had a show on YouTube. And so she had shown us all the episodes. Everybody was like, she even got like standing ovation, like claps. Everybody was happy. It was such a great night for everybody. It was a viewing, not just the people in the house, but all sorts of people had come over and we had enjoyed the show. Only for almost a year later now, November, 2021, where Paulinus and his family, they are incensed that I left. They don't know where I am, but they just happened to know that oh, at some point I had given bags to my friend here, Roxy. So they now go all about, you know, trying to drag Roxy's name through the mud, talk about, oh, and she even had a show where she was being salacious. She was a very immoral kind of show. Whereas these are the people that gave her a standing ovation just the year before. A year later Mm -hmm. now, they're trying to drag her and then drag the show and make it seem as if it was some sort of porno. Like, that's the way they were just describing it, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exactly how they were describing it. Yeah, so, exactly. So, I I was just shocked because I'm thinking, okay. So, you can imagine, this is all they had to say. So, now my mind flashed back to when we were done with that trip that year. Mm -hmm. And when we were on our way back. So, this Paulino's dad, he calls me and then, you know, he hands me an envelope, right, by the end of the trip. So I take it and I open it. I check inside. There's some money in there. And obviously I'm thankful. I'm like, OK, you know, I have some money to take back to Lagos with me. So I was even shocked that he gave it to me because at some point, he and I, we seemed to be at odds with each other during that trip. Like there were things that were being said at the table that I didn't necessarily agree with. And, you know, he had other reasons and I had like unpopular reasons for what I thought as well. So I was shocked to see the money, but I was like, OK, you know, maybe it's something they do to people maybe when they visit. So I said a very nice and respectful thank you, sir. If I hear you correctly, what you're saying is, You were very shocked by the antagonism, the bringing up, you know, things that happened over December 2020. They were talking about your dressing. They were talking about your appearance. They were talking about, you know, like different about your show, your hair. Uh So they were talking about all of that and trying to paint you as some sort of Jezebel that you're my single friend that has a poor influence on me and that this is why I left my marriage or whatever, whatever. So they were trying to paint you as all that. And you were just like, where is all of this coming from? Especially since you now come to me. I was leaving. You gave me money. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, you don't give me your card. So you can imagine, look at all the nonsense that these people had to say about me when I hadn't even provoked them or whatever. I hadn't even done anything at all. You can imagine if I'd used that business card. Mm -hmm. based off of everything they were saying about me if i'd even use that business card to just even call to be like hey sir how are you can you imagine the degree of nasty things that they would have said about me look at what they're saying about me unprovoked Mm -hmm. if i try to call that man after that day you can imagine because right now in their eyes i'm already a prostitute and i'm already doing like because i feel like the audience really needs to understand this so Right. Well, dad, it wasn't uncommon for him to give people cash or whatever money in an envelope. I already told you guys in my financial abuse episode that me, I used to show up there and the guy would shake Akbada and money would come out just because, you know, Paulinus was just, that house was austere. So at, at the end of our time in AKT in December 2020, Roxy is leaving and Paulinus's dad hands her an envelope of cash. And Roxy is a little, she's a little bewildered because, you know, she wasn't expecting it. 
on like how everybody else's demeanor in that house when Paulinus's dad comes into a room and everybody's cowering, everybody's just, you know, keeping quiet. He makes some ridiculous comments and everybody just agrees or keeps quiet. Roxy was in there fighting. Like Roxy would be like, no, sir, I don't agree. And they'll be going at it. You know, I even used to get concerned that, hey, Roxy, sure, you know, pipe down. Like, <laughs> you know, this is not the vibe. In this place, this man is the king girl. Oh, this one that you're doing, don't let, <laughs> don't let this thing backfire on us here in this house. But Roxy was always just going toe to toe with the man. For some reason, I don't know. At the end of the trip, the man hands her this envelope of cash, of which Roxy's a little shocked because, again, they were always going toe to toe. So the envelope of cash was unexpected. But what was even more unexpected was the business cards that he included in there. And that's the one that shocked me. Because when he told me he gave you cash, I like I didn't really bat an eyelid because I'm like, yeah, he usually gives people cash. But when he told me he gave you his business card, you know, that made me uncomfortable because that's unusual. More so, he doesn't really have a reason to be giving you his business card. Like at no point are you guys ever going to cross over in business or in anything. If he wanted your contact details, it would have been more appropriate for him to come through me and be like, hey, I, I your friend do. Uh, her number, blah, blah, blah. I just want to say, do you get what I mean? But for him mm-hmm. to like, kind of corner you and like give you his business card, that definitely stood out to me. I raised my eyebrow a bit at that. So for me, when he was now going on this campaign a year later and telling everybody about, oh, see the way she looks, she see how she exposes herself, you know, see how she does this, she does that. In my head, I was just like, oh my God. This guy <laughs> is a geezer. That explains the sleaziness, the envelope of cash, the, the slipping you his business card. Do you get what I mean? And a lot of women understand this language. They understand this language of men who they desire you, but they hate that they desire you. So they want to drag your name through the mud. Yeah, it was a really weird place to be in at the time. I was just like, what is actually going on here? Mm. Because there are many things that I found out like much later that I wasn't comfortable with. The fact that at some point I heard they had gone to my house to look for me. <laughs> mm. That was just really weird. Yes. To me. So, um, just to um, let everybody know. So in that fuller response email that Paulinus sent out to me and to everybody else that he copied, he described how he and his family were camped outside Roxy's house, looking for her, waiting to almost kind of grab her and, and interrogate her. And unfortunately for them, she was at work. So they could yeah, never- And I told them as much. I said, I'm on set. They said they wanted to come to the sets. And I asked the producer, he said, well, sorry to close sets. And I told them, sorry to close sets. And that was it. I didn't even know they were camping outside waiting. How ridiculous. So they were very incensed by that. And again, I really do have to say, I just thank God because Roxy, I don't want to know what would have happened to you if they got a hold of you that night. If they got a hold of you that night, I'm sure what would have happened to you, you probably have been locked up in some cell just to just even deal with you for in their minds, you aiding and abetting what you do not even know about. They just didn't care. They were just incensed. Um, these people. So I'm just so grateful that you managed to avoid all of that. God just orchestrated it that way. And it was the simple truth. It wasn't even as if I was even trying to play foul with them or whatever. Like I genuinely was on set. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, I just thank God that it's God that ordered your steps that way. Because what if you you actually were at home? You wouldn't have had any reason to not see them. You would have probably gone and be like, "Eh, yes. And who knows what they've done to you then? Do you get So God definitely like ordered your steps and I'm just so grateful. But even speaking about this now, the next question I think I need to ask is what advice would you give to people that are like supporting or, you know, being friends with someone who happens to be in an abusive relationship and maybe they reach out to you for help in some way or the other. Sometimes you might not even know the kind of help you are rendering. Kind of like in your case where you don't even know the help you are rendering. But what advice would you give, especially in retrospect, when you know everything that happened? Because your own safety was compromised. Your own, like you were in clear danger with these people, with the attacks that they came at you with full frontal, trying to like smear your name. If not for the fact that my parents were just like, no, I, we know this girl. Not just my parents, the other people that they were talking to about you. You know, who knows what those ones even did or what they said or... Do you get what I mean? Like, what advice would you give 
to people in similar positions as you where they just find themselves being a safe space. Yeah. I just want to say that whatever happens, whatever they're doing, it needs to be for reasons other than the victim. And I say this because like, it just really has to really be intrinsic in your heart to like, just be there for somebody. And it's useful advice because I've been in situations where I've shown up in the same capacity and Unfortunately, these victims sometimes will go back to their abusers, like sometimes two days, three days in between, other times a week, two weeks. But I think that what's more important is just like being a safe space, regardless of like whether or not the person finally is aware of their own abuse. And that's what I would say. And to just continue to empathize because, you know, victims aren't only weak people. I think sometimes they're some of the most successful of us, some of the most accomplished of us. Anybody can be a victim and it's kind of abuse. I won't diagnose anybody, but for me, it feels very narcissistic. And I don't know that there are many school curriculums that even carry things like that in them. So, you know, potential victims are not aware. Um, it's so easy to get ensnared in the trap of somebody. So leading in that sort of empathy when you are that space, it will free you from any kind of judgment. And it will give you all of the room in the world to just sort of like be a champion for them in their hour of need. I'd say, let them tell you what they need. You just do what they need at that time. No questions asked, honestly. Right. So Roxy, thank you for that like thorough response. And I really do like that you said that when you are a safe space like that and the help that you offer, it can't even be about that person, really. It really has to be about the cause, about the, you know, just the greater good of it all as to why you're renting. Because a lot of people, a lot of, victims we don't i don't like to use that word victims on here i I call us warriors a lot of warriors it it might take them a couple of tries before they're able to make their escape their freedom permanent so Uh sometimes you can be a touching point for them one two three four or five how many times before they finally even gather the strength to actually leave permanently so it's definitely easy to get frustrated if the help you're rendering is just really about that person It has to be more expansive than that. You know, so it's important to realize. But then I also wanted to mention that as much as you want to be there for people, I think that one thing that I had to do, and I also recommend this for you to do what you need to do, but also prioritize your safety as well. Like, for instance, you know, we talked through how it became unsafe for me as we were doing everything we were doing. And we had to take extreme steps, you know, this, you know, to make sure that, I'm safe. Uh, Like we're all safe. Um, So I would also ask that, you know, anybody who's being that for other people, prioritize your safety. And also if there's nobody that has said it to you just yet, I want to be the first. And I want to be the first in saying that I want to thank you for being a safe space for victims of abuse. It's selfless work. It can feel thankless sometimes. But thank you for showing up. Thank you for creating space. Mm -hmm. And thank you for inspiring other people Mm -hmm. because there will be more people like you. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you so much, Roxy, for saying this. Um, Because honestly, I don't even know what this whole project is about. All I just know is I felt called to make sure that I document my story. I don't Mm -hmm. know what this project will do. But I think first and foremost, I recognize it to be a healing space for me. And if it manages to be a healing space for other people, oh my goodness, I would be all the more blessed to have answered the call of actually putting this project together. But I know I'm not the first and I know I will not be the last. And that really is just the heartbreak of being a woman in a world that wasn't created for us. And so I just pray that this project that I've put together, Authenticity Warrior, it can serve as a liberating tool for Many other people, it can save people a lot of heartbreak. People don't need to enter the castle that I entered (laughs) before freeing and liberating themselves. And that's my hope and my desire. But I would like to circle back to something when you said safety, because guys, I think this is something that we even learned the hard way. Because like we said, Roxy was actually very open. She didn't even really think that she did anything wrong. 
I mean, her friend asked her for help and she showed up and helped. So even when Paulinus and his family were calling, she was actually picking their calls. She was making herself available. She was answering their questions. She did not hide anything. In fact, even got to a point where even his star, Junior Pepeye, the one that we call Junior Pepeye on this podcast, that's his younger sister, who I was very close to, who I really did take as a sister. And I thought that even if this marriage ends, that's a relationship that I will make sure that I maintain because I really showed up for her. But I was very distraught when Roxy told me what she did. I just could not believe the way this girl had essentially not even stabbed me in my back, but really stabbed me in my chest. Like, I just couldn't believe. So what I'm referring to now is shortly after it became clear that I was not around, they could not find me. They had harassed everybody, my parents, my family, my friends that they had their contact details of, Roxy included. At some point, Junior Pepe, Paulinus's younger sister, calls her and begins to strike up a conversation and then almost started to insinuate in the conversation that, oh, baby, she has mental health issues, right? You know, for me, I've noticed that I've always known that she has mental health issues. She always seemed mentally unstable to me. You too, right? That's what you felt too, right? And so, I mean, when Roxy was relaying the conversation to me, immediately I'm just like, it seems like this girl was trying to get you on record to say something about me, to say that, yes, indeed, yes, I I have mental health issues and I've been struggling with mental health issues and, and always seemed mentally unstable to you. Unbeknownst to us, in the backdrop where all of this was happening, Paulinus and his family had run to a kitty to file for divorce. They had filed an ex parte motion trying to take all three of my children away from me. And the basis on which they were trying to do that was they had claimed that I was mentally unstable. They had claimed that I was a member of the LGBTQ community. They had claimed that I was an atheist. And then they had claimed that I was a bra burning feminist. Now, after receiving their court documents and seeing all of this, This is where the conversation that Junior Pepe was now trying to have with Roxy finally made sense because it seemed she was trying to get Roxy on record as, hey, this is one of her closest friends, even saying that, yes, she was mentally unstable. So talk to me again, Roxy, about that conversation and what it made you feel when you were having it. Yeah, because I genuinely was worried and concerned for your own safety as well. So when people were calling me and whatnot, obviously, you know, I wanted to know what everybody else knew. So I was sharing whatever information that I had. And like when I was asking and whatnot, and we started talking and we were talking about you and the possibilities of what might have gone wrong, et cetera, et cetera. That's how she started asking me about how I felt about you, um, the state of your mental health. And started reminding me of instances where you might have not been in the best mental health condition. And through that conversation, again, because I know you and I know like where your head is at, usually what you're thinking about, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, I don't think so. And I kept sort of like negating this when she kept trying to, you know. And I said, at the end of the day, even if, yes, yeah, she's going to therapy, but like, you know, I think everybody should go to therapy, like, you know. So I can't quite remember the conversation, but I remember that was a huge part of the conversation, you know, her talking through how she had felt that you had been on your last wit. Again, I was innocently just relaying our conversation with you. And then we realized that based off of context that you have in terms of like what they had in those divorce papers, then we might have just walked into a trap. So first of all, I want to congratulate you, Roxy, on not falling for the trap because as much as they were trying to lay the groundwork and do the setup, you were just like, "Ah, no, I don't. (laughs) She hasn't seemed mentally unstable to me. And yeah, she's in therapy. And me too, I'm in therapy. I mean, I believe everybody should be in therapy. So I'm glad that they were not able to covertly co-opt you into saying something or getting them to manipulate your words into um, making it mean something that was not your intention. Again, for me, as much as I'm very disgusted by this family, the deep sense of pity that I feel for them, because this is a family that actually struggles with serious mental health issues. I share on this podcast that in 2021 is the first time that Paulinus ever mentioned to me that at some point when he was in Toronto, he had been diagnosed as bipolar. 
the way my stomach dropped, I say it a lot over the course of my marriage that I feel like I was just moving from one severe shock to another. Every time my stomach is always dropping, I feel like, okay, it cannot drop any further. Something else comes out and my stomach drops again. How dare this guy be telling me for the very first time that he had been diagnosed as bipolar? And what I know about the condition, you should be on medication. So for me, I'm just like, oh my God, the chaos of my life since I met this guy is finally explained because I'm a very chill person. I've lived a very peaceful life. But since I met this guy, it has just felt like I've just been running from one crisis to the other. So I'm just like, my goodness. So you're supposed to be on medication. You've not been attending to your mental health. Are you serious? Then I also share again that his sister, and again, I just want to put that out there. I'm not putting her out. This is something she has spoken about publicly. She has written a book about it. It is available on Amazon, on Indigo, anywhere you want to buy books. This, his sister has an official diagnosis as well. This is someone that has suffered three mental breakdowns to the point of actually being confined to a psych ward. And it is very all the more disturbing that this is now their own attitude to mental health. If this is how they want to be talking about mental health to me, simply because I left a marriage, they've been trying to frame me as some sort of like as if I stripped naked and was walking Third Milan Bridge. Whereas this is a family that has serious mental health issues that need attending to. And for the most part, I believe they've been raw dogging it through life, which that is their concern. If they were the kind of people that listen to advice, they better be taking their medication, all of them. But again, for people who are victims of abuse, fellow warriors like myself, let me just tell you now, this is their playbook. When these abusers are abusing you, it is always their initial reaction when you react to the abuse to call you mentally unstable. Because how does one really defend themselves? from that kind of accusation. It's the kind of accusation that if someone throws this out at you, if you even try and defend yourself, you might even start looking mentally unstable. Do you get what I mean? Like, it's the kind of accusation that it requires a lot of tact when you're responding to it. Anything less than a very calm, a very rationed, a very well put together, eloquent response, anything less than that, and indeed and truly, you will in fact look mentally unstable. And it is one of the most disgusting things that abusers do when they do all these things to you behind closed doors and then you react rather than let us peel back the layers and look at everything that brought this person to this point. They rather want to focus on your reaction and make everything about your reaction and blow it out of proportion and make it seem as if they didn't do anything so that indeed and truly you look like an irrational person. So the fact that I picked up, I left like a thief in the night with my children. That's to tell you the level of abuse I was enjoying in the hands of this man. I felt like I knew this man was going to kill me if I did not leave that house. Physically kill me. This guy had lined the whole house with CCTV cameras. The level of control, what this guy was about to do. And this is the first time I mention it, it now because I, I realized that I never mentioned it in the other episodes. Prior to my leaving, the week I was leaving, this guy showed up to the house with a lawyer and wanted me to hand over every asset that I was holding in trust for the children, wanted me to hand it over to him. Thankfully, I had noticed, because I felt so backed into a corner that I had to sign. Thankfully, I had noticed that his names were matching up on the documents. And so the lawyer insisted that, ah, no, there's no way I can sign. He would have to come back with the documents. Thank God I did not sign. This guy was gearing up to do something devastating to me. So, of course, I picked up and I, I fled with my children. So he and his family, they now want to focus on the fact that I fled. Of course, why would I tell them anything when I already noticed that these people did not have my back? So they've been trying to frame my escape as some sort of mental breakdown. One thing, one thing, you know, I just had my baby. So they were trying to push the whole postpartum depression narrative, which is something that I had never suffered from. Yes, I see a therapist. I believe everybody should see a therapist. She's been great. You know, I have no shame about that, but I have never been diagnosed with anything in the, I forget, there's this book that has all the, (laughs) is it, I forget Mm -hmm. the term now, all the mental health issues Mm -hmm. that one could have, the DSM or something like that, where you can actually receive an official diagnosis. I have no official diagnosis. I see a therapist as part of my mental health and I make no apologies about that. Whereas these people have been trying to frame me as something that I'm not. And the funny thing is, these are people that live in freaking glass house. How dare they be throwing stones 
day. So I guess all of this is just so, again, guys, I tell you this, if you're a fellow warrior like myself, watch out for when your partner, if you haven't left yet, tries to frame you as unhinged, tries to frame you as deranged, tries to, you know, they use certain words to make you seem as if, oh, you're acting out. Your reaction isn't really proportionate to something. It could be very subtle where they keep trying to do these things to you. Sometimes they say it to your face. Sometimes you will not even know about it. They'll be saying it to people around you, your family, your friends, but they will never say it to you. So you have to be very careful, guys. It's really wild out here. So I said all of that to say thank you, Roxy, for navigating that conversation as well as you did. And again, this is why Junior Pepe, if she's listening to this podcast, if she ever hears this, I would never have anything to do with you again. I have nothing to say to you. And I guess that's just that on that. Moving back again, because I do want to speak about the fact that you had come to Ikiti with me in December 2020. (laughs) Again, you didn't even really know what you were walking into. I just knew I needed a buffer. 2020 was a difficult year in my marriage. That's when Paulinus had really just been acting out all year. And so I I just knew that I didn't want to be alone with his family in Ikiti. And so I invited you to come. Can you describe for me just the atmosphere that you experienced, just his family dynamic, the setup, the way it was? Like, how did you see things through your own eyes? I mean, like you said, I was pretty much just happy to be there. It just felt like every single person had to... First of all, let me allude to the fact that, you know, remember, I didn't quite agree with some of the things that he had said. Who? Polly was um, dad. His dad, yes. I didn't quite quite agree with some things. And you could well, see no, how... Why Paulinus's dad is the typical, traditional, misogynistic Nigerian, mm-hmm. if you will. So he would say some outlandish things about women and the place of women. Mm-hmm. And, this mm-hmm. and, that. and in true Roxy fashion, she just wasn't having it. And so she would push back and be like, no. So I was pushing back on some of those ideas, like openly and, you know, he kept trying to get me to see what wasn't trying to be seen because the connections, it just wasn't connecting. And I kept, you know, countering it with like realistic points. So it almost felt like, you know, I was doing what, I don't know. It was just like this weird culture of silence around him, which, like I said, I noticed, but I didn't care much for. So I just kept talking. And then I also just kind of noticed his wife, how he would even speak to his wife. Mm. Sometimes he would be so aggressive with her. And her place was for, ah, she was always cooking, she's in the kitchen. And again, like, I don't want to discredit voices of people who enjoy traditional marriage setups, right? That's one thing. I'm speaking on this based off of some of the patterns that I noticed that could have even also informed some of Polinus's like weird behavior. In fact, it even makes sense. When you think about it, some of his expectations, like where there's a huge gap in terms of like what's expected and what's received and all of that stuff. So I just noticed, you know, just the way they had again, a, a, a traditional setup in their house where everybody yeah. is daddy, everybody is quiet and, you know, tiptoeing, a very mm-hmm. actual environment where anything can go down. <laughs> you know, people are just always tense. But what I really appreciated, sorry to hijack the conversation, what I really oh, no, please. was like Roxy just showed up as herself. She didn't really care what the vibe was and she was just always being herself. And so, of course, that ruffled Paulinus' dad's feathers. And it caused them to be going toe to toe and everybody would just be in shock because they've never really seen their father be challenged like that. You know, (laughs) if we're sitting down beside each other, I don't be trying to tap this rock seat. Hey, like leave this conversation alone. (laughs) <laughs> Let's and rest kind of thing. <laughs> and the good thing was that I never took it personal or anything. Like once we were done and we moved on to a different activity or whatever, like I was like, yo, you know, it was never anything. So for me, I was happy to have the arguments for what they were, but I just feel like because of whatever culture it is that they're practicing there, like it might have been, you know, more definite than it felt like I intended. 
Yeah, it it definitely landed as being defiant because they don't dare speak with their dad like that or even engage. If their dad says this, they don't dare challenge. So that's just what it was. It was a very repressive environment. And for me, like I told you guys, I, for some reason, happened to be in his good graces on like every other person, including his wife, like Roxy has confirmed here. I didn't even know that she even noticed like the way he would talk to his wife, the way he would just deal with her, very abusive. And so for me, because his good graces shone on me, I just used to just uh, let me not fall out of these graces. Or <laughs> I would just navigate accordingly that way. And just for the most part, just mind my business. I never ruffled feathers with him or the sort. But yeah, I, I'm so glad that there's someone else here, in addition to my sister, who I also interviewed that can confirm that, look, their home setup is the kind of environment where Paulino's been an abuser. Yeah, of course. Look at where he's coming from. You know, look at what, what he's been exposed to. Look at what he's learned. Of course, he's abusive. Okay. So, I mean, I'm so glad that we got to, I guess, kind of attend to some of these different topics here that you know I'd been alluding to over the course of Authenticity Warrior. And I'm glad that I'm able to bring in your perspective. So to just kind of wind down a little, I think I want to ask you, like, what are some red flags for you that, you know, you feel like you had noticed in, you know, my relationship with Paulinos and even things that for yourself that you know that, oh, look, like for me, I wouldn't be able to tolerate this. And, you know, even for the people who are listening on here, things that they also too can watch out for and be like, hey, this is a red flag. If you see this, like run. Okay, so let me start with just some of the red flags that I noticed with the relationship itself, which number one, before I even mention everything else I want to talk to you, just first of all, just even the secret nature of the relationship. Because, you know, remember you noticed, right? Like even when I would ask about details about certain things, like we didn't really get into it until it started really becoming an issue in your marriage. For instance, let's, we can talk about even just the strangling mm. for instance happened during the relationship right do you want to like share context for that or yeah so what roxy's referring to like i've mentioned over the course of what the disney warrior is the fact that this guy strangled me six weeks to our wedding and i didn't tell a soul about it so i think what roxy's now referring to is just when there's this culture of secrecy around your relationship where you feel like you can't share you can't say whether you're protecting the relationship whether you're protecting the person whether you're even protecting yourself, if there's this air of secrecy to the point where you can't even share things as deep as that, then that is a serious red flag, right? Exactly. That's what I'm referring to because oftentimes, you know, I would think back and realize that like a lot of what I knew about your relationship was like closer towards the end of the relationship. And then the only time I would really hear about it was maybe when you would make an Instagram post celebrating something. And then the other thing I'd look out for is isolation, right? Like I know isolation for you, baby, is like some, an introverted quality that you might have sometimes, you know. Well, you still like to go out sometimes, but in Nigeria, you know, we were getting no action unless I came to your house. Was this true or not? So you, you are right that I am introverted, but I have to admit that my introversion, it went up because like, of the isolation and the abuse, I just kept on going further and further into myself. I couldn't even come out and be the bubbly person that I knew I could be, you know? Exactly. Because at some point, I even stopped inviting you to things. If- yeah, because you knew I wouldn't come. Unbeknownst to you, um, Roxy, a part of the reason why I couldn't come was, yes, the abuse. Abuse turns you into a shell of yourself. That's one. But then also for me, it was the financial neglect, the abuse. I knew I couldn't even show up to these spaces because I couldn't look the part. I mean, I'm right. a Lagos girl. I'm actually from Lagos. My family is from Lagos. So I, I know that Lagos thing. I understand it well. I knew I couldn't present myself in these spaces in a way where I could hold my head up high. I remember when you, I think you had even passed a comment and I had even told you that it's true. My entire closet, these are clothes that Roxy, we went to the same university. We went to the same way in Canada around the same time. Like these are clothes that I brought from Canada. This is still five years into our marriage. And my closet was two majority things that I had brought from Canada with me prior to my marriage. A lot of these things were outdated, but I couldn't update my closet. I couldn't, Mm -hmm. I could only rely on like piecemeal 
occasionally I talk about how I had found this tailor from Unilag somewhere that will sew things for me, three, five, three K. But I had to be managing how I would use her. My closet was in a dire state. And so when Roxy is out here living her best life, you know, because of the nature of what she does, you know, she's out there, and but I could never be there with her because I couldn't show up. I just couldn't. I couldn't show up as myself. I also couldn't show up just even with the packaging. I couldn't. <laughs> I would stick out like a sore thumb, you know? Yeah. And this is what kind of like brings me to the third thing that I would like people to even look out for, um, which is like the person even looking like they're doing well. <laughs> like, is there any like visible, like, you know, aesthetic improvement? You know, and it's not to say that people who look a certain way don't get abused or whatnot. Like in this instance, right, it was just the fact that, you know, it was so glaringly obvious for me that we were wearing the same things from like years back (laughs) in like (laughs) uni, right? For me, it was that, right? Now, while, for instance, take someone like me, I definitely like to... Like, the longer I keep something for, like, depending on the number of years, right, the more endearing it is to me. So sometimes I also like to just keep things, not hoard, um, but just to keep things that mean a lot to me. So it could be that. But then you asked me in terms of, like, just, you know, what people could watch out for, right? And while it could be that, it could also be, you know, abuse. And this is something that we want to make sure is not an assumption on our parts, and it could even happen the flip side where somebody is constantly prim and perfect outside. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, um, Roxy, I do want to circle back because, again, for people who, who know me, I was even like a retro queen. Like I loved to like thrift shop. So my style wasn't even necessarily the kind that was on trend, if you will, because I'm really just a throwback kind of girl. Like for me, I would love to live right. in. 50s with their beautiful dresses and you know that was just that that was my vibe but the way Nigeria was like I couldn't even bring that vibe there there was just so much that went into play to why I just couldn't even keep up with the culture in Lagos and I couldn't keep up because frankly I was in law school I couldn't work and this guy was giving me 50k a month to take care of everything you know, even after my son was born, I was still collecting 50K a month, including formula that would be 25K. So um, I, already, <laughs> I already mentioned how the, the money that my parents were giving me to take care of my obligations in Canada, I was diverting it to just plug holes in this house. If I'm lucky and I show up to his parents' place, his dad will give me some funds and it could vary what he would give, you know? So things were definitely tough. And you're right, Roxy, in that that culture of secrecy, I couldn't even say things to you. I couldn't tell you, even though when you tell me now that there were just some things that just didn't make sense. Like when you come to my house and maybe you see you know, the kind of food, it seemed like it was really egg that we ate in that house. <laughs> you know, we could never... Really that's, that's, you know, it was comments that I would make, right? Like, for instance, like, you know, when you didn't even... This was just unprovoked. I remember when I commented about the fact that he wasn't hands-on with the children. I remember, but I literally felt a deep sense of shame and exposure. And he just works a lot. He's busy. He, he loves them, I think. But, okay, that was not the question you asked. You didn't ask me if he loves them. You said, why is he not hands-on? But I just quickly tried to just deflect and just be like, hey, he loves his children or whatever. And I actually remember physically feeling irritated that, gosh, oh, like, why is this Roxy, like, asking? Or did you guess? Because I really felt like I was going to be exposed. Right. Know? And until you're the kind of warrior that looks yourself in the eye and admits to your abuse, you will fight anybody that tries to tell you that you're abused. You will fight to that nail. And that's why, for me, I understand where I see some fellow warriors, they are in their mess. And they are fighting their support system to remain there because it's it's tough. Like you have to look yourself in the mirror and say to yourself, this person that I believe loved me actually never did. They in fact hate me. They are abusing me currently. And if I stay here, they are going to kill me. A lot of fellow warriors are unfortunate in that they actually get physically killed but let me tell you, um, it is even worse than that physical death. It's the spiritual um, one where you're there for yeah. decade after decade. You know, when there are people are trying to say hey, they've been married for 50, 60 years. But when you look at that woman, you can tell, my God, she's gone. That spiritual death, she's gone. 
this guy has used her up completely. She's no longer there. For anybody that is being abused, those are your only options. So if you stay there, you're going to die, whether you like it or not. And each day, you're in, inching closer towards your death. Whether one day, one day, the guy will push you. One kind, one kind, you fall, you slam your head somewhere and that's how you go. Or some of them, they get mind because most of the time they are cowards, but some of them, they get mind. They actually carry knife, carry gun, kill you right there and there in cold blood. Right. And then in other instances, you're just going to be there. You just go, as they say in Yoruba, you will just dry up. Like you become a complete shell. You don't even know who you are anymore. You are nobody. You just become an extension of your abuser. They say, come, you go. Like you're no longer there. The, the thing that makes you you, the thing that makes you unique, the thing that God puts inside all of us that makes us who we are, the guy has scooped it all out and implanted his own self in there. That, of course, comes from their coercive control and direction and their anger and their rage at you just even trying to express some independence of thought they will break you down completely until you are submissive to their will and their will only. So yeah, thank you, Roxy, for bringing these things up, these red flags up. These are things that uh, I knew they were happening to me, but I felt powerless. I didn't know. I moved to Nigeria to be with this person. I had no reason to be in Nigeria. So for me, how was I going to begin to unravel all of that? I already I have three children now with this person. How was I really going to unravel all of this? You know, so I I really did feel trapped. And if I was not backed into the corner that I was where I could feel this man and his family about to devastate me in a way that I knew I wouldn't recover from actually literally about to kill me, about to take my children away from me. Oh, I'm not sure I could have someone the strength to escape the way that I did. And I mentioned all the time that it was still very much 50, 50, I didn't know up until I actually got into that plane and we sat down and that plane took off. I still was not sure that I could do it. So, um, yeah, I'm happy to be on the other side. And I'm just saying, thank God my strength did not fail me. Thank God my strength did not fail me. And I just want to say thank you again, Roxy. I cannot thank you enough because I'm close enough to know what it is that you were dealing with at that time in your life. And you held all that up for me. You know, if you had said, hey, babe, like, honestly, I feel for you, but this is too much for me. I'm not sure I have the bandwidth. I actually would have understood because it would have been understandable. But the fact that you didn't and you still showed up, that is amazing. And I I just want to, and that's why you're the rock star. That's why I'm giving you the name Roxy. <laughs> you're serious rock star. <laughs> All right. So, Roxy, do you have any like, last words to say to the people? No, my last words are really and truly for Polinus. <laughs> and I hope that he's listening to me when I say, fuck you. Fuck everything that you stand for. Fuck you for trying to fuck up my friend's life. Mm. You're an inconsiderate, stupid bastard. And I truly hope that every single thing that it is that you have due for you is coming to you in this life. I'm not going to pretend here and act as though I wish you well. No, I don't. I really don't. So please, if you manage to figure out who this is, just avoid me. That is all. Ah, and I think that's a good way to end it. So thank you guys. Um, we have one more person to interview, but who knows? Maybe we would have played her own interview before now, but altogether we will be interviewing or have interviewed... Um, my parents, we've interviewed or are be interviewing my sister, Roxy. And then there's one more person, which is another friend of mine, actually, who I run to when Paulinus physically, verbally, psychologically, you know, just abused me all night. Um, this is the February 2020 incident. And this is the friend that I ran to and she begged me to leave. <laughs> And I didn't have the strength and I, I, I didn't. So we're going to be getting her own point of view as well. Um, so thank you guys for listening and um, we'll check back in soon. All right then. Bye guys. My discernment about what I am facing has made me a target, but I must nonetheless speak up. Make no mistake. This is still a live and ongoing issue and myself My children and loved ones continue to be in danger as a result of my coming forward with the truth. I want it on record that should any calamity befall any one of us, 
my abuser and his threatening family should be the first people held as persons of interest. Authenticity Warrior is available everywhere you listen to podcasts and is at Authenticity Warrior across all social media platforms. Please feel free to like and share this podcast. Thanks for listening.